this, oh yeah, he's turning it on, this to here. So we're doing a video, but I, I'm radioactive. <laughs> what should I do? Uh, maybe it's my list. <laughs> so I am beyond excited to be here tonight. Uh, this is my 19th year coming to this retreat. I may first turn 57 years old, which is why I'm blonde, because I'm hiding the gray, and I, I'm hoping for a, a, a part on Baywatch, I think, maybe. Um, no, I went into my hairdresser and said, uh, I need, I'm tired of the gray roots, and this is what we came up with. So, uh, if you look on my website, this is not the same person, because there's a brunette on my website. But I, uh, the first time I came here, I was 30, I think I was 39 years old. Who's 39 in here? All right, who's 38? Okay, you're going to be 55 and 57 tomorrow. It happens that fast. Okay, another question. How many of you are first-timers in here? Okay, stand up for a minute, you first-timers. Come on, stand up. Let them see them. Let them see them. Awesome! Now, all y'all that have been here, those women should not ever be standing alone with no one talking to them. You guys are in for such a treat. I spoke... 56 times last year, and I'm reeling it in. I'm not going to be speaking that much this year because it's a lot. But of anything I have been asked, pastors, wives, ladies, especially this event that has been so near and dear to my heart, I'm just excited to be here. And I, as I got through my notes, I don't have my glasses. Um, Dottie, you get my glasses. Would you, would you, Dory, you get my glasses right there. I said, called you Dottie, sorry, Dory. In my outside of my black bag. Yeah. See, I, I, I keep forgetting that I'm old and my eyes are old on the other outside. There we go. Otherwise, I can't see my notes, and I, I could wing it, but, you know. Thank you, Dory, I know it's Dory. <laughs> okay, now I can see. Let's open in prayer. Father God. Oh, that you woo us to come away with you. Who are we? Who are we? Father God, I know that you know the names of every single woman in here. And I know, Father, that you have called us to be with you this weekend at this event. You know the hearts that are weary. You know the ones that are facing prodigal children difficult marriages, insecure about being called a pastor's wife, just having a great year. I thank you, Father, that these women have taken time out of their lives to come away with you, to come away with these women that you have chosen in history for this time, for this crazy ministry of minister to the minister. Father, I pray that my words would bring you glory, that your word would not return void, that it would accomplish that for which you are going to send it this weekend. And I thank you and I praise you for this honor to speak truth into the lives of these amazing women. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I have a little secret for you. You did not come to a retreat. You came to a summit. Girls, we've been called to California. Do you know what that is? I mean, if, if you could be, you know, consider being a missionary somewhere, California, call to Cali, hashtag call to Cali, ladies. Let's start it right now. I'm telling you, that that is my heart. My heart is California, gospel to California. Hashtag please pray for California. As goes California, so goes the nation. And there's some crazy stuff going on here. And I don't know if you know about the bill that's getting ready, it's AB 23. 49? I can't remember. Um, it's going to affect free speech in the churches. AB 2943. I am telling you, God is entrusting us as warriors for Christ. There's a scripture. I want you all to pull this out in your Bible. This is, I've added this just before I talked because I really wanted to say, I want you to have this in your notes. Habakkuk 1.5. Everybody pull out Habakkuk. Do you know where that is? And in the back. Again, at the back of the book, in the back of the Old Testament. Habakkuk. I just wanted to say Habakkuk. Anybody name your kid Habakkuk? By the end of this year, I will have 10 grandchildren. 
So I'm always trying to help them come up with names. They don't want my help, but Habakkuk. Habakkuk 1, 5. The first time I read this scripture was on the day of 9-11. It was on the day that the towers had been attacked. And, and how many, did your church, was your church packed with people that Sunday? Ours was. I don't know where they went now, but they were sure there. <laughs> and I came across this scripture in Habakkuk. And it says this. This is God talking. This is the Lord's reply to Habakkuk. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded for I will work a work in your day which you would not believe even though it were told to you. Ladies, you have been chosen by the utmost highest God in history for this time and there's some stuff going on in the world that we wouldn't be it's lining up for the... How many know Jesus is coming back? <laughs> it's lining up. When, when he ascended into heaven, what did the angels say? They said, he's coming back to this same spot on the Mount of Olives. Ladies, Jerusalem just became... Right? Just became, What's the word? I can't think of it. I need some protein. Uh, became what? The, the capital. Capital. Thank you. Can't get words. Um, that is incredible but look among the nations and watch and see that God is doing something in your day that you wouldn't believe even if it were told you. Do you think that Esther knew that God was doing something amazing in her day? She was just doing her thing. Do you think that half of the people in the Bible, when they were in the middle of whatever was going on in their life, that they were like, oh, this is going to be in the Bible one day. No, they're just living their lives. Because I guarantee you, if Abraham thought it was going to be in the Bible, he never would have had sex with Hagar. Man. Talk about following you around. <laughs> God in history has called us to this. And I know we need a retreat. We need to get away and hang out and laugh and eat chocolate. And I didn't eat my cupcake yet because I don't want blue teeth before I talk. But it's okay. I'm going to eat it later. I get that we need to come away with each other and we need to meet with the Lord. But ladies, in history for this time, God's doing something astounding. And he's called us to minister to the minister. I mean, you go to bed with it every night. And that's what I want us to leave with, this understanding. This is a summit. This is a prayer summit. We are going to pray for the state this weekend. We are going to pray for your babies and your grandbabies. We lived in Austin, Texas. We planted a church there. And i got to tell you, Steve had been a youth pastor at First Baptist Patterson before we went to Texas. And they called, the pastor of, of Patterson called one day and said, hey, just want to let you know that I put in my uh, resignation. I'm going to some another, another town. And I knew, a little whisper in my heart, that we were going back. Anybody ever have that? And then I went like this. <laughs> and for two and a half years, this church called us every six months and asked him to come back and be the pastor. We were living in Texas. We had planted a church in Austin. Kids were coming to Christ like you wouldn't believe. We had zero to 200 teenagers in one summer. And these kids in the Bible Belt were actually introducing them to Jesus, not the God that they heard about all their life. Wow. And these kids were coming to Christ. And their parents started coming to Christ. And it was a brand new church. Anybody planting churches? Anybody a church planter here? You don't have the this is how we've always done a crowd. It's kind of cool. <laughs> And it was a blast. And we were having so much fun. And you know, Texas, it's conservative. The schools are amazing. You walk on the junior high campus, they're like, yes, ma'am. I'm like, where am I? I'm from California. I'm from Southern California. Uh, but I'm telling you, I didn't want to go back to California yet for two and a half years. And, and I'll tell you the story. I wasn't going to tell you, but since I got a little time. When they asked us the last time, after two and a half years, Steve said, I'm going to go check it out. I said, oh, dude. I said, I'm not going to go with you because I don't want to go. But I'm going to stay here and I'm going to pray for God to give you wisdom and I will follow wherever God leads you. But if I go, I'm going to talk you out of it. <laughs> and so he went, but I knew we were going. And he came back and he, this was in uh, 99. And he came back and we talked about it. We put all the kids in school and Steve said, we, you know, we kept, what about this? What about this? He said, today we're going to talk about it as much as you need to talk about it and then we're not talking about it anymore. Because you're talking it to death. We're just going to pray. 
And we had told our senior pastor and a couple other close friends, but not a lot of people because we could have easily been talked out of leaving and we didn't want to go. And so I made a pros and cons list. Anybody do that? <laughs> and the pros list said, stay right there in Texas. Everybody's doing good. My, my oldest, our son was excuse me, graduating from A&M University. He was going into the Air Force to be a fighter pilot. Um, he's only got two years left till he retires now. That's crazy. And uh, our oldest daughter, Meredith, was a junior in high school, doing great, walking with the Lord, part of our ministry. And so I make a list, and it's like, well, the pros say we should stay right here. And I, we made two pots of coffee. It was a two pot of coffee conversation. And then we said, we have, we're not going to go. And then immediately the Holy Spirit described our hearts. And we both just started crying. We said, we have to go. Have anybody been there? Come on. Come on, let me see. Let me see. Yeah. We have to go. And I said, okay, but Meredith's got to be on board because I don't want to lose one of my kids. And Meredith was crazy because she said, I don't want to go, but I can't help but think this is about my adult life. And I'm like, who are you? <laughs> eggs in that basket. <laughs> and we moved Y2K, we moved December, our, Steve's first Sunday was December, no, January 1st, 2000. We bought a case of tuna and a bag of beans. And we're like, if everything falls apart, we'll have beans and tuna for a little while. <laughs> and ladies, I cried the whole way back. I drove, Steve drove, I cried the whole way back. I did not want to. But you know how God makes it irresistible that you can't say no? And when we pulled into the town, and this church had been two and a half years without a pastor, so they had shaken down to a handful of people. So we were going to a, a very small congregation. They could hardly pay us a salary. We were taking a huge cut. Well, I can tell you more about that story later. But as we pulled into the town of Patterson, I almost had an anxiety attack. And then I heard the still small voice in my heart that said, do not be afraid or dismayed, for I am your God. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I will help you. I think that's Isaiah 41.10. Ladies, I didn't even know I had that verse memorized. You know how you, you help your kids memorize scriptures or whatever? But you know when the word's in your heart and you're freaking out, the Spirit of God, and you know that's the Spirit speaking to you. And, and when that happens, be in awe that God talked to you. Don't take that for granted. And I said... Okay. And then the scripture, remember when Paul went into, I want to say it's Corinth, but I'm not sure, I can't remember right now. Um, and he kind of was freaking out about going into this town, and God said, don't be afraid, for I have many in this city. And that scripture came to my heart. Okay. Okay. Wow. That was 18 years ago. Our church is filled with young adults that got saved and came to Christ, uh, senior adults that have come to the Lord. And you know, here's the thing. God knows who they are before they surrender to Him. Their name is written in His book. He tells us, go get them, girls. I'm sending you to reap the harvest. And sometimes as pastor's wives, we lose track of that and we become the social calendar girl. We become the event planner. And we lose sight of this incredible calling that God chose you in history for this time to minister to the minister. When we first go to a church, people are always like, so what do you do? Do you, do you sing? I'm like, oh, heavens no. I do, <laughs> I do but it's really bad. <laughs> Do you play the piano? Do you work in the... I worked in the nursery one Sunday and I broke a kid's leg. Actually, I didn't break it. I watched him break it. He stepped off of a little bench and he fell and he broke his leg. And this lady was trying to adopt this child. I had to write a, a letter to the judge to say, because he was a foster kid, like, I, it was me. And I was like, why were you in the nursery? I was helping. He was like, no helping. He was just, I'm just, I'm just But when people, when you come to a church, don't they ask? Because they want a twofer. They don't want to pay you. Oh, no, heavens no, unless you want to work in this office <laughs> or clean the toilets. But they go, what do you do? Because we want a twofer. You, you, you know, we know what he does. What do you do? What do, you do? And this is what you say. I sleep with the pastor. <laughs> it shuts them up. <laughs> and I have 
have an ebook out called I Sleep with the Pastor. But it's true, because nobody knows what this gig is a pastor's wife, except all y'all. And it's crazy. You've wept with your man when he's cried over someone in your church. You've heard him alone in his office, on his face, praying for his people. You see him study. So your church just thinks he works on Sunday. They don't get it. You've seen the time that he puts in, and you know what God has called him to, and nobody gets it like you. And he's called you. He chose you to minister to the minister. So everybody say with me, God chose me to minister to the minister. God chose me to minister to the minister. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. It's a very unique position, but God trusted you with it. So this isn't a retreat. This is a summit. And I am praying that we leave this mountain on fire. Broken over what we see. There's no hope for the state of California with politics. That, that is not their hope. The hope is Christ. In Christ alone, their hope is found. And God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Don't lose sight of that. And God has called your husband to preach the word and to deliver truth. And you've got his back. Don't lose sight of this incredible ministry that God has called you to. You know, they say 1,500 pastors a month leave the ministry. And it may be in higher now. That was like in 2008 when I was on the council that we did that statistic. I don't even know what it is now. 1,500 a month. The number one reason, do you know why? Because it's hard on their families. And their children and their wives and their marriage. God has called you. So, backing up a little bit, when Steve and I were uh, first married, we lived in the Bay Area and we lived in houses and we fixed them up. And because we couldn't afford to pay rent in the Bay Area and pay a mortgage on a house we were fixing up, we actually moved into the fixer uppers. Um, we could have had a show, we just missed it by that much. Um, <laughs> And we would flip a house and we would move into the next one and we'd flip a house and we'd move into the next one. And we did that and all the time that we were flipping these houses, Steve's goal was to be debt free and to be in full time ministry. At that time he was working in construction and we worked at the youth group at our church in San Jose. But uh, I didn't meet Steve till he came home from Bible college. So I married a contractor that made pretty good money. And I was happy being married to a contractor that made pretty good money and then being the fun pastor, youth pastor's wife and let's take them all out on our boat and give them a ride in our Mercedes and let's just, you know, right? And so we were living it up and having fun, flipping houses and Steve kept saying, I want to be debt free and we kept praying, I want to be in full-time ministry. And long story short, one day our youth pastor had left our church and our, uh, St this, the one that was paid on staff and we, the pastor came to Steve and said, we want to hire you full-time, I want to put you on staff. Steve came home and he's like, they asked me to be on staff. I'm like, dude, that's what we've been praying for. This is awesome. And he goes, Rhonda, we can't afford it. I'm like, what do you mean we can't afford it? And he's like, the boat payment, the Mercedes payment, the house payment, the credit card payment, all of those things that we're keeping them afloat right now. But if we took that job, we can't afford it. And in that moment, we both realized that we were praying with our lips, Lord, we're available, use us, send us, full time. But we were living not available. Right? So we were convicted. So we decided it was time to cash out and get out. So Steve was looking all over, and he went to college in Denver, so he was looking in Colorado, and I didn't want to move where it was snowed. So he found this ranch that we have now um, in the middle of nowhere. And the day that we went and looked at it, it was snowing, just a little tiny snow, you know, at Mount Hamilton, who's from San Jose? The observatory, so it's up behind the observatory. Uh, so we're, you know, this beautiful snow and this little cottage covered in snow. And I see my husband is in, like stargazed at this ranch. And I'm holding his dream in the palm of my hand. And everything in me is like, not this girl. Uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. I mean, it's 45 minutes to get from, we have a Livermore address, 45 minutes up a mountain, we only get mail twice a week. We have a Livermore address because that's the only post office that will deliver up there. And I saw this man's eyes light up. 
I'm like, okay, let's do it. So we sold our house. The house on the mountain closed escrow. We went and looked at it. The snow had melted. Ladies, we bought a shack. It was cute when it was covered with frosting, but when the shack, when the snow melted, it was horrible. And the people who had sold it left the doors open, so all the critters that were up there were all inside, and there was, I mean, it was, it was a nightmare. I was like, and, and Steve just starts laughing, and I'm crying laughing. You know how you cry laugh? And we moved into this one bedroom shack, we called it the love shack. We had one bedroom, we had two kids at the time, we put them on the bunk bed, we slept on the sofa bed in the living room. We heated it with a wood-burning stove. We had no power. I lived on a generator for two and a half years, ladies. I had a butane curling iron in the 80s that saved our marriage. And that was my life. And I was like, what? How is it possible? And one day, oh, oh, um, we didn't have power, so we only watched TV for a little while at night, but then we weren't tired. So I accidentally got pregnant. <laughs> Best accident ever. <laughs> So I did my whole pregnancy with Kayla on our sofa bed in our living room. And I remember the day that I told Steve, I, I know I'm pregnant. I, had, I, I burped the pregnant burp. Anybody? <laughs> and he's like, you're not pregnant. He brings a little stick home. And yet, then it had to be first morning urine. So I go in and I pee on it. I climb back in bed. It's five in the morning. He's getting ready to leave for work. He comes out and he goes, it'll be fun. And I'm like, it'll be fun if I live in San Jose. And I remember one day, I was pregnant with Kayla. Meredith was at the, one of the last one-room schoolhouses in the nation, was up there. So Meredith was at school, and Brandon was two years old in the house, and I'm pregnant with Kayla, and we had uh, horses, because when you move to the country, of course you get horses. And alfalfa looks like ground-up money, trust me. <laughs> and our neighbor's cows are eating our hay. Plus, our water pipes are above ground, so the neighbor's cows would break the water pipes. I had a 250-gallon tank of water that had to last me till Steve got home. Now, mind you, Steve's going to work in Pleasanton. He's in an air-conditioned office, and he's driving an air-conditioned car, and I am like, living your dream, dude. <laughs> and I remember weeping after Kayla was born, saying, please let me go to work, you stay home. <laughs> this is your dream. <laughs> and I was on this hay bale, like, they weren't bales, they were stacks, you know, the, and, I, I'm, and I literally had a two-by-four, and I'm pregnant, and I'm hitting a cow over the head. I honestly, and I'm like, no! And then all of a sudden I look at myself and see what's happening. And I have a two-year-old and, and I'm like, and I throw it. Oh, how is my life? I was, I was homecoming queen. <laughs> and I went in the house. And that was my life. <laughs> so what's your story? <laughs> Sometimes when stuff like that happens, and we get uncomfortable, God shows us what we're really about. Even that comment, I was homecoming queen, I deserve to be comfortable. I deserve not to have to fill in the blank. And God pulled me out of my comfortable little world, humiliated us, not just humbled us, humiliated us. People would come visit from San Jose and be like, are you serious? Really? <laughs> And yet, God did so much work in that season when we were humbled, when we were in that situation. And uh, I'm trying to decide if I want to tell this now. I'll tell it real quick. Ten years go by. We went to Texas at some point, and maybe I'll fin finish that story. And then they called us back, and we ended up, because we just stumbled across this little church in Patterson. And Steve ended up being the youth pastor there. Because we, we were driving over Mount Hamilton to San Jose for a year and a half. We drove over to our church in San Jose, and Steve's finally like, we have saw, I was pregnant throwing up because the road's like that. So we found this little church in Patterson by accident. And then after we had gone to Texas and this church called us back, we didn't sell our ranch because you can't leave California and buy the same house. We knew that. So we had some friends living in it for six years. And when we took this job, we went back and we lived in our ranch. We had no mortgage because Steve had gone to, way back then to be debt free. He built the house as we had the money. And here's this tiny little church with hardly any members and a tiny little budget. And we moved back and we could take the job and not have to live in the parsonage, which we would have, but they were using it for the nursery. <laughs> because more than 10 years before that, God had put in my husband's heart to be debt free because God knew he was going to call him to minister in this little church. We had no, no uh, medical insurance. We came 
I'm telling you, pros and cons was to not come, but God was faithful. So everybody say with me, God chose me to minister to the minister. God chose me to minister to the minister. We're going to do acrostic this weekend, and it's going to be the acrostic of hope. And here's your points. I'll give them to you now, and then we'll get them. All we're going to do is one tonight. Humility, one in love, path to peace, and eternity. But all you have to remember tonight is humility. First point under humility, so that's like Roman numeral one, humility, is, A under that is toward others. First Peter 5.5 5 says, clothe, your, clothe yourself with humility toward one another. Especially, this is like talking about, uh, it's a Greek word, and it's talking about like an apron that you tie around yourself like a work apron. Slaves would wear that. So what he is saying is clothe yourselves with an apron of servanthood. Could that have been, maybe Peter was remembering when Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. He clothed himself as a servant to wash their feet. That was in John chapter 13. Humility is an attitude that you're not too good to serve others or too great to handle tasks that seem beneath you. And we all know that as pastor's wives. I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> Philippians 2, 3 through 5 says, Do nothing from, selfish, from selfishness or empty conceit. Have this attitude in you that was also in Christ Jesus. And then Philippians 2, 6 through 8 is where he talks about let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider robbery, robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and he humbled himself becoming obedient to the point of death even the death on the cross. See pride and selfishness naturally dwell in each one of us. Pride is the one sin that God says he will actively resist. That's in 1 Peter 5.5 5 and Proverbs 3.34. Sometimes God shakes us up to humble us. And I, me moving to the middle of nowhere uh, was definitely what God was doing, and I needed that. I didn't even know people that weren't Christians. I was in my church bubble. I didn't, all of a sudden, I, my kids are going to school at a public school with people that don't know Christ. All of a sudden, I'm in a, a completely different arena that I needed to be in to realize how much I had even missed opportunities to share the gospel. What does pride look like for a pastor's wife? We deserve to be appreciated. Gossip to our kids about the church, people at the church, I would never. Look at that, I would never. Look what they do. I would never. Yeah, you would. Without Christ in you, you would too. Can I get a witness? All right, I want this to be interactive. Come on, girls. Come on. I want to hear it. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Yeah. Right? Jesus warned Peter. This is Luke 22, 31 and 32. Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brothers. Isn't that cool? Because did you realize Jesus said, Okay, dude, Satan is crouching at the door and he wants to eat your lunch. And Jesus didn't say, I ain't going to let him. Right? You think Jesus would say, but I'm going to fight for you. No. He said, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. This is going to be rough, Peter. You know that guy that cut the ear off of the servant and said, uh-uh, no one's taking Jesus, I will fight. And Jesus said, dude, we're not doing it that way. And he said, I would never deny you. And Jesus said, by tonight, when the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. No, I will not. To you who think you stand, take heed lest you fall. Ladies, humility is knowing I am, I, I could do any of those things. If David himself, who wrote some of the most incredible worship psalms known to man, could have sex with a woman that wasn't his wife and then kill her husband to hide his sin, if David could do that, you could do that. And your husband could do that. And if you find or you hear of someone in ministry that has done that, my husband's best friend had an affair. And see, here's the thing. Sometimes they're at the bottom of their game in ministry where they're just getting kicked around, not being appreciated, feeling like nobody's, you know, I'm not making the money, can't pay my mortgage, whatever. And sometimes, like David, he was at the top of his game. He didn't mess up when he was, he didn't even kill Saul when he had the chance. 
Now, I would have been going, okay, God delivered him into my hands. I'm going to kill him while he's being on a rock in that bush over there, or in that cave over there. But he had the discernment then to say, I will not raise my hand against God's anointed. The same guy, when he was looking at her taking a pornography, he's looking at porn, and he tells his servant, hey, go get her for me. And you know, the Bible says that there is no temptation that is common to man, but God will not uh, will offer you a way of escape. His servant had the guts to say, you mean Uriah's wife? Dude, I think that was David's way of escape. And David said, yeah, I mean Uriah's wife, go get her. He was at the top of his game. His pride, he was supposed to be out where other kings were fighting a battle, and he was just resting, right? And if David will do that, and my, my husband's friend committed suicide. Dang it. That was like almost 30 years ago. Couldn't forgive himself for what he did. Satan woos them to fall and then destroys them because they do. And you take heed lest you fall. You pray for your man. I've prayed over the years for Steve that he would have eyes only for me, that his love for me would grow, that, you know, when my husband counsels with women, I'm in the room. Don't give place to the enemy. And it doesn't mean you walk around suspicious. Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant of Satan's schemes. And same song, second verse, a little bit louder, a little bit worse. It works every generation. Satan just keeps doing it because it works. And we have got to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Don't gossip to your kids about what you would never do or how you would never let your kids act. Uh, how about the us against them mentality? Oh, you know, we're the pastor's family, so, you know, we can't have any friends. Yeah. Oh, you know. No. See, I get that being a pastor's wife can be lonely, but it doesn't have to be. And I get the word real is thrown around a whole lot these days, be real. And that word can almost be a little bit too uh, in your face. But can we be genuine? Can we be genuine? Can we in a, a ladies Bible study say, hey, I'm, I'm really struggling right now. I remember when I was uh, menopausal, which I'm done now, thank you. See, I have a jacket on? I think I did, I don't remember how many years I was here in a tank top, but now I can actually wear a jacket. <laughs> And I was having hot flashes, and I was super needy. Like, I just wanted to be with Steve all the time. Like, I just wanted to be next to him all the time. He was like, oh, this is awesome, and I'm radiating heat, you know? <laughs> and, and I remember, like, standing up one Sunday morning and saying, hey, can y'all pray for your pastor, because his wife's crazy. <laughs> and they laughed. I go, no, I'm not kidding. I'm going through menopause, and I'm really needy, and I'm sucking the life out of him. So if you could pray for him, you pray for me too, but really pray for him. And it was funny, but it was real. It was genuine. I was really fragile. And I wanted them to know where I was coming from. See, as goes the pastor and his wife, so goes the church. So if you pretend like everything's fine, if you pretend like you got it all together and there's nothing going on, they're going to pretend too. And if you want your church to be a family that is real and genuine and honest about their struggles, because the Bible over and over says, over and over says confess your sins to one another. Is your church a safe place to do that? No. Would you do that? Being genuine is humiliating and humbling and freeing. Because you don't have it all together, so stop pretending. And your kids know. You know, in 18 years of youth ministry, it used to be 75% of teenagers left the church and never came back. I don't know what the statistic is now. And the number one reason was hypocrisy in their Christian home. I could go up to a kid whose dad or mom were meth addicts and say, hey, honey, Jesus loves you. Me? He, he loves me? And I can go up to a kid that's raised in the church and say, hey, Jesus loves you. Yeah, I know. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. I got it. And mom and dad are pretending to be happily married at church and they bicker the whole way home. They're pretending to have it all together but the kids know. And that happens even in our pastor families, our pastor marriages. And if you want to drive your kids away from the church, don't be genuine. And they'll see you. 
They'll see you go, bye, sister so-and-so, and get in the car and be like, oh, I can't believe she let her kid wear that to church today, and look at her. <laughs> see, your kids think that's normal. So your kids think everybody else just got in their car and talked about each other, too. Because you're teaching them what normal church family life looks like, right? And if you're gossiping, and please be willing to look at this, because I was a gossip and I didn't even know it. I, when I was in uh, the Bay Area, I remember like it was a prayer request. That's all. Oh, did you see? What? Oh, oh, oh. And when God moved me up on a mountain where I couldn't, every phone call was long distance, except my one neighbor who lived next to me, and she was not a believer. Well, I'm not going to gossip to her because I want her to come to know Jesus. <laughs> you know what I found out? I didn't know how to have conversations that weren't gossip. God convicted me. Do you know God hates it? We'll stand on a street corner and we will hold up a sign about what we think God says is an abomination. How about in the church parking lot? Gossip is an abomination to the Lord. It's an abomination, ladies. If you're a gossip this weekend, stop. From here on out, stop. You are killing the joy in your heart. You are quenching the spirit in your life. Your passion for Jesus. Remember that, that time when you were just like so in love with Jesus that you would do anything or go anywhere he called you to go? Which is why you ended up in Patterson, California. <laughs> and why did that go away? Is there something in there? Is there some sin that's entangling, that's t t taking your heart? See, we're not supposed to always be up like emotionally, but there should be this fire in our bosom. There should be this passion for Christ. You know, I used to, I grew up and I, I went to Christian schools and I saw people and everybody said they loved Jesus, but every once in a while, I'd meet somebody who really loved Jesus. Do you know who I'm talking about? And I would be like, I don't have that. I want to have that. And I just thought, well, that's just for some that get to love Jesus like that. And everybody else is just kind of wandering around like the Jews in the wilderness. We just do our thing. But there's some VPs, you know, MVPs, and that's one of them. And, and that's not the case. God calls each and every one of us to fall more in love with Jesus every day. And Paul said, kick off those sins that so easily beset you and run the race. Ladies, you have been called to this. This season in history, before the second coming of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, I don't know if you're raising the generation that's going to go through hard times. I pray for my grandkids like I never pray for my kids because I know the dark's getting darker, but you know what happens when the dark gets darker? The light gets lighter. That's right. And it is a privilege to be called, to be trusted with this. When you're genuine, you will be free from having to pretend like you have it all together. In Moms Raising Sons to be Men, there's a section called People Pleasing Isn't Pleasing. I'm a middle child people pleaser from way back. I'll make you all happy. And then there's Control Freaks, Raise Freaks. There's also a section in that book. Because what happens is, when we were in uh, San Jose, I remember when uh, Meredith was skipping around the church. She was four years old and making some noise after church was over. And a pastor friend of ours saw me shush her a number of times. And then he finally said, well, why do you care? And I finally, after he kept pressing me, he said, well, I don't want people to think I'm a bad mom. He goes, never raise your kids for what people think of you. If you don't hear anything else I said, if you're still raising little ones at home, you do not tell your kids, I can't believe you were talking in church. What are people going to think of your dad? Don't put that on your kids. Don't raise your kids for what people think of their dad or what people think of you. When we moved back from Texas, we had met in schools and we lived on a lake, so everybody would wear, you know, jeans or shorts and their bathing suits underneath. And as soon as church was over, this hair is doing something crazy. Um, and doing, they, would, they would go on the boat. So it was very casual. And we lived on Lake Travis. Somebody from Texas, you know what I'm talking about? Lake Travis, like the third coast, uh, they call it. Uh, it's 65 miles of shoreline, super fun life. But when we moved back to California, the girls that were there, the parents of the, ch the girls that were there, made their daughters wear dresses to church every day, every Sunday. And so, Steve and I were like, well, what are we going to do? Because Meredith loves the Lord, and she has a passion to serve him, but she's used to wearing jeans and t-shirts. I wouldn't let her wear a bathing suit to church. <laughs> do we make her, you know, dress like a pastor's daughter? And we decided not to. We got a little flack from it. But m my concern, Steve's concern, was more that we had our daughter's heart was in love with the Lord. And, and people would say to us, 
my daughter wants to wear jeans to church now because your daughter's wearing jeans to church, and so your daughter needs to change so that my daughter and I don't have a fight. To which we said, do you have a conviction about your daughter wearing jeans, I mean, wearing a dress to church? Yes, I have a strong conviction. Then you, if, if you don't keep that conviction, it's sin for you, but we're not convicted, so it's okay for us. And it's one of those things that my daughter, who was a junior in high school, we moved her from her wonderful to Patterson, California, <laughs> And we had to step up for her. And she knew this isn't about how dad looks. This is about what God, what, what God, dad, my dad has for me. Let your kids know you have their back. Now, you don't get it in your face and like, oh, we'll do what we want. That's not, that's not the point. The point is, as I was shushing Meredith, Vaughn was saying, why do you care? Some people think I'm a bad mom. And I knew I would have ruined my kids. If I had not had an older person, see, Titus 2 calls the older to teach the younger, and that's why I love this ministry, yeah. because some of the older pastor's wives that I met here almost 20 years ago have changed my life, and they have poured into me, and they have prayed for me. See, back in the olden days, there was no Facebook. And so Nancy Wilkerson used to get all of our email addresses, and anyone who wanted to be on the prayer email, we would email it, she would put it all on there and email. It was very much, much more complicated to stay in touch. Um, and those women, I loved watching those women love being pastor's wives. And I wanted to learn from them. And Titus 2 calls the older women to teach the younger. And there's very few older pastor's wives. Because let's face it, when your husband steps up as pastor, usually the pastor retires and they leave. Usually. They don't always, pastor's wife doesn't always stick around. They go, you know, whatever they do. And so this pastor's wife is in this position of not having anyone to mentor. What's that? Find out. <laughs> That's right. So, one of the stories that I, um, Dory, we get real life romance out of my bag. <laughs> I'm so, my dog ate my homework. Um, thank you. Vaughn, it's the white one. Did I bring it up here? No, I didn't. Oh, I did bring it up here. Just kidding. I got it. Sorry. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll ask you if I do. <laughs> so Vaughn's kids grew up, they were amazing parents, and I loved watching that pastor's family be a pastor's family. And one of their daughters, her name was Allison, and Allison, when she was babysitting for a man in their church every week, years later it came out that he had seduced her. She was, she was a young teenager. She had become a bulimic while she was living at home, and her mom and dad couldn't figure out what was up. She got married to her high school sweetheart, and they moved to uh, go to college, and she turned upside down. She had an affair. She, her life flipped upside down, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. And I, we went on vacation with these people. I loved these kids, and their mom called, pray for Allison. This is what, and we're like, what? And Allison's story goes on until finally God brought her to repentance and she became a single mom. She repented and she came back to the Lord. It came out that this man had raped her when she was a teenager. Um, she kept it a secret and didn't want to tell anybody. Um, wait, they're pastor's people. This is a pastor's family. How did this happen? And Allison just decided she was going to live for the Lord and she moved to L.A. and she was raising her son and she was seeking the Lord and she sings like you wouldn't believe. And so she was singing. And then Real Life Romance is just a culmination of a bunch of love stories. It's like 25 standalone, individual, amazing accounts of God's sovereignty and providence in knitting lives together in second chances and in true happily ever after, not the love that we see. You know, you watch a movie with your kids and all of a sudden they're in bed and you're like, oh, but they got married. When? Oh, they must have cut that scene, but they're married now. <laughs> These ones your teenager can read. But Allison let me share her story in here. And as Allison was just focusing on being a mom to her little boy and singing in her, in her church, there's this guy named Sean. And Sean is driving down the 405 freeway, and all of a sudden he hears on the radio, just happened on a Christian radio station, the gospel. And Sean had never heard it before and was weeping, had to get off the 405 to pull over, which you know that's a miracle if you can get off the 405. <laughs> Because he couldn't see because he was crying. And right there in the car, Sean accepted Christ. That's why I love radio. I do a lot of radio. If you go on my website, you can get links to that. And then he didn't know what to do about it. 
And he went to work, and a woman at work who said, hey, Easter Sunday, you want to come? And he goes, sure, I'll come to church with you. He walks in, and Allison's on stage singing. And Allison, he's like, oh, God will never have that for me. I've been a womanizer. There's no way God will ever have that for me. And in their story, it goes on, and you'll find out how God knit their hearts together. But Allison said this, I had, made, I had messed up my life pretty badly, and I was living the consequence of those decisions, and it was hard. And then they, I'm just going to tell you because it's faster. He, he ends up, uh, they're always in different things, crossing paths. They end up falling in love. They both get discipled for a long time before they finally um, get married. And Allison says she was not ever truly saved until after that whole thing happened in her life. She had prayed a prayer when she was a kid, but she had never really surrendered her heart to Christ. And she went to her dad's church and told them, repented of her sin. And he didn't ask her to do it, but she wanted to. And then this is, at the end of each story, there's a ponder this and ask yourself. It's kind of a devotional, what to tell anybody. Um, I must admit, I got a little teary-eyed. This is me talking. While I wrote this story, I've known Allison since she was a little girl. I remember praying over her with her parents as she rebelled against her Christian upbringing. I also remember celebrating the work God did in her heart when he brought her to genuine repentance. Even when they make a mess of their lives, God is ready to forgive and show mercy to anyone who will call on them. When God brought Sean and Allison's life into, into Allison's life, we all watched in awe as he graciously did a work in both of their hearts to prepare them to serve Christ as husband and wife. She just spoke at a, at a woman's retreat for uh, her dad's church that her dad's retired from now, and I got a, a message from someone that said she did an amazing job. You know, because when God breaks us and humbles us, he's like, okay, now I can use you. Okay, now you're not all that in a bag of chips. Good. Now that we got that out of the way, now I can use you. And Jesus told Peter, Satan wants to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. And when you come back, oh, Peter, you're going to turn the world upside down. Remember in Acts when it, said, when it says, they who have turned the world upside down are here? Those prodigals, our youth pastor was a prodigal. And when he came back, he came back, guns a-blazing. And I know some of you in here are praying for prodigals, and we're going to spend some time praying for them this weekend. Everybody say, God chose me to minister to the minister. God chose me to minister to the minister. In, if my husband would change, I'd be happy, and other myths wives believe, the ridiculously long title of the planet. Um, there is a story about Michael and David. And you know, David... Uh, the next point, I'm sorry, I'm going to give you your next point. Humility toward your husband. So we did humility toward others. Didn't we? Yeah, humility toward others. Now we're doing humility toward your husband. So I'm going to tell the story because it's faster than trying to read it. It's, it's in 2 Samuel chapter 6. After many years of exile, the day finally came when David was anointed king of Israel. As his, after his coronation, one of his actions was to have the Ark of the Covenant brought into the city of David. When the Ark finally arrived... We're told that David danced before the Lord with all his might. You don't think Israel has a right to call Jerusalem their, their why can't I think of that word? Capital? Dibs. And as David danced before the Lord with all his might, he stripped down to his loincloth in his speedo and he danced before the Lord. And where was his wife? She was not dancing alongside of him. This was Michael, Saul's daughter. And then it says David went and took the whole town and they had a big sacrifice unto the Lord. And where was Michael? Not at the barbecue. She was at home. But she'd been watching out that window. And he walked in the door and as soon as he walked in, the Bible says to bless his household, baby, your king is home! And she's already got her argument in her mind formed. Do you know what I'm talking about? You've had that argument so many times. As soon as he walks in the door, you start blasting. He's like, where's this coming from? And you're like, boom, 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 boom. And he walked in the door, and she's like, oh, how glorious was the king today dancing in his underwear in front of all the girls? <laughs> Read it. Something like that. <laughs> and who was she? Oh, she was princess. She was Princess Michael. My daddy was Saul. I know how to be royal. Obviously, uh, you don't, because you're dancing in your chonies. Let me fix that for you and let me straighten you out. Talk about disrespect in a moment. Just shut him down. And I love his response because he's like, it was before the Lord that I danced. And I will become even more 
undignified than this, girlfriend. Like, you just watch my smoke. <laughs> but don't we do that sometimes, ladies? Your pastor husband walks in the door after some amazing deacons meeting that they voted X, Y, Z, and he's been praying, and now it's going to happen. And he walks in, and you're like, dude, you forgot to take the garbage out. The garbage truck came. This house reeks like diapers. Right? Or do we do that? Or do we do this? Oh, let me help you be more pastoral. Let me, you need to present yourself the way a pastor would present himself. And so I, I saw the way that you did this or that, and I need to help you be more pastoral. Mine is ironing. I do not iron. My husband does not trust me with a hot, burning object. I am very clumsy. So he irons his own clothes. All my boys iron their own clothes. All of us girls, we just spray it and hope for the best. And that man walked into church one day with some pants that had been hanging over a hanger, and you know how that little on the knee? And I'm like, dude, you can't do that. He's like, what? I'm like, look at your pants. He's like, I think I have iron. He goes, you don't. I'm like, I don't. It's, when it's that little rigidy thing, it's not coming out. It's not coming out. But sometimes we try to help them, and we help them in a way that actually undermines them or makes them feel like they're undignified. And hopefully your man will say, girlfriend, I am going to become even more undignified than this. God chose me to minister to the minister. They say that. God chose me to minister to the minister. The last point for tonight is humility toward God. So B, we had humility toward others, humility toward your husband, humility toward God. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter 5.5. 5. We know that, right? Do you know that's the only sin that God says he actively resists? Other sins, there's going to be consequences. But if you're going to be prideful, wow. And sometimes the pride is just in, we would never, I would never. Why does God hate pride? That's what prompted Lucifer to say, I will ascend into the heaven, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will make myself like the most high God. That was his sin, was pride. God's grace is reserved for the humble. Isaiah 57, 15 says, For thus saith the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, I will dwell on a high and holy place, and, and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit. God said that. Please, 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 let's not lose the awe of God speaking. God said that. I dwell on the most high and with the lowly and contrite. <gasps> Isaiah 66, 2, God is talking again. To this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. Under that humility towards God comes the point of purity. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Jesus said that, Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You want to see God for who he really is and not who you perceive him to be? You know, there's a scripture, I can't remember where it's at, where God says, you thought I was altogether like you. I ain't like you. Get out of your way so you can see me for who I really am. But ladies, we have got to say, Lord, show me my sin. I'll justify it every time. I'll blame all of you every time. I want God to show me my stuff. I want a pure heart. I want to see God. Oh, I want to see God. Don't you want to see God for who he really is, not who you perceive him to be? You know, one of the big things in our church and in our culture is pornography. It's huge. And there's a lot of pastors that deal with that. They say pastors' conferences, 
Um, I don't think it's so much now because now there's the internet. It used to be like in hotels, you could rent porn on your TV. Now they can even be more secretive about it because they don't have to go pay the bill at the hotel. But hotels used to say pastors' conferences were full of men looking at porn. And you know, the Bible says that what we feed our flesh, our flesh craves. And the 30-something crowd opened a door when they were kids that they had no idea that it was going to eat their lunch. Chuck and Angie, I tell their love story in real life romance. I knew Chuck and Angie from Texas, and they uh, grew up. She was in our youth group. She had come to the Lord. She was going to stay a virgin until she got married. Um, but before she was in our youth group, she was at a, a, like a True Love Weight conference in Austin, Texas, huge stadium. And she had decided her junior and senior year of high school, she wasn't going to date anybody. But she said, I'm going to wait till I find someone that God's going to have me marry. And then she said, but God, you know, someone like him. And this kid walked up and he had a baseball cap on that said Promise Keepers and he had a Christian t-shirt on. She was like that. And thousands of people, he turns around to walk away after the concession stand and someone walks up and goes, hi Angie, hi Chuck. And it was Chuck's sister. Thousands of people. And she introduced them. I won't tell you the whole story, but they were virgins when they got married and Steve and I did their premarital counseling and they got married and then all of a sudden Angie found that he didn't want her in the marriage bed like she had expected. It was kind of disappointing. And then one day she stumbled upon the internet, what he was looking at, and she confronted him and he said he was sorry and he wasn't going to do it anymore. See, he was in junior high when the internet first came into our homes. This was back in the 90s when it was just a new thing and parents didn't know. And in a junior high boy mind, this makes perfect sense, I'm going to use pornography to keep myself pure until I get married. And that's what he did fully expecting that he could put it away after they got married. But anyone knows that at whatever we feed our flesh, our flesh craves. And so, as of course, he told her he was going to put it away, he didn't. Angie was de devastated, and it was a long series of, and you can read their story in the book, but Angie says this. Finally, Chuck got help. And she says this. For me, my sin of unforgiveness, I had to realize that my sin of, of unforgiveness was just as ugly as Chuck's addiction to pornography. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. He will exalt you in due time. She was so mad at him. She was so resentful toward him. She couldn't even pray powerfully for him. See, John James 5.16 says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous one accomplishes much, Right? Ladies, there is no sin worth holding on to if it renders your prayers powerless. There is no sin worth holding on to if it renders your prayers powerless. We need powerful prayer warriors for the state, for the kids that we're raising, for God to send us, because he has many in the state. We have many in the city. Who are they? God, send us. We want to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no sin holding on to. Worth holding on to if it renders your prayers powerless. Everybody say, God chose me to minister to the minister. God chose me to minister to the minister. I'm reading 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 16. Look it up if you want to. This is Paul. 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 16. And Paul is Timothy's father in the faith. He loves Paul. Paul is writing him a letter, and under all this persecution that's been going on, Timothy gets this letter from Paul, knowing that soon his father in the faith would be facing imminent death. Ladies, feel that for a minute. Feel it. Feel it. They're just people in their generation that God called to suffer. Why? To validate the testimony of the witnesses. Do you realize that? I used to get really bugged that all of Jesus' camping and fishing buddies died horrible deaths, boiled in oil, cut in asunder, or lost their head. You know, these are like Jesus' buddies. Why would God let that happen to his buddies? But not one of them recanted. It validated their testimony. All one of them had to say was, we made it up. He did not rise. Not one of them recanted. And 
and validated their testimony, and thousands of people came to Christ amidst that persecution. But feel that. I mean, think about it. Women who, who were in their homes before Paul came to Christ, when he was Saul, and he was zealous to have these people arrested. And just think, if you were standing there, and your husband is being ripped out of your arms, and you're grabbing your kids back, and you're saying, no, please, no, no. And off he goes, and you never see him again. And he is thrown to the lions, whatever. Feel this. These are just people like you and I, and God called them to that. And there are people in this world God is calling to that right now. And he's not calling you to it, at least not yet. So what are you doing with your freedom? What are you doing? 1 Timothy 6, verse 11 through 16, but you, this is Paul talking to, Dave, uh, to Timothy, but you, oh, I'm going to say woman of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness. Godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Verse 12, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Verse 13, I urge you, urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you, Timothy, you ladies, Keep this commandment without spot, blameless, until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in inapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. A woman of God is known by what she flees from. That's in verse 11. What she follows after, also in verse 11. What she fights for. I have a CD back there, and I think it's from Philippians chapter 4, and it's called, What, what Should We Fight For? or something like that. Um, and what she is faithful to. God requires, in, Ma in Micah 6, 8, he says, he has told you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, that you do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God. Humbly. God, humble us this weekend. Peter's advice was 1 Peter 5, 6. He says, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at a proper time. The mighty hand of God's power means that different things in different times. It speaks of deliverance in Exodus from Egypt. It speaks of a time of chastening, and it serves as a shield of protection to believers during a time of testing. Think of Job. God's mighty hand was on Job while he was going through this time of testing. Take time to feel this, as Job says this. I cry out to you, O oh God, but you do not answer. Have you been there? Are you there? Hey! I stand up, but you merely look at me. You turn on me ruthlessly. With the might of your hand, you attack. Me. Anybody ever felt like that? I have. The mighty hand of God was a testing for Job to refine him as gold. You know when the silversmith puts the gold or the silver in? And it's in the fire and the dross, he wipes it away, sees if he can see his reflection. And then he puts it back in the fire. He never leaves it. He's not going to destroy that silver. He's purifying it. And then he pulls it out and he wipes the dross away. And he sees how well he can see his reflection. And he keeps doing that. And he gives it a break. And he, that's what God does with us. He puts us in the fire. Our life is seasons of being purified for the glory of God. So that when God looks at himself, when Jesus looks at your life, more and more he sees his image reflected in you. You know, when the Bible says that you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your bodies, that word glorify means to reflect his character. In Isaiah, where God says, I created you for my glory. I used to think that meant to be happy. I created you so I'd be happy about you. No, it means to reflect, to live in a way that it creates an appetite in others to want to know your God, beginning with your children. And then, when God finally humbled Job, he said, surely <laughs> I spoke of things I do not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. My ears have heard, had heard you but now my eyes see you. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Job's like, what? I do sacrifices in case my kids may be sinned. I, I follow the rules. And God's like, yeah, aren't you all that? But I'm going to purify you so you see. Anybody been through the dross? Been through the fire? Man, it's hard. But God humbles us through testing. I remember the year that um, we, before we moved to Texas, um, the company that Steve had worked for uh, was closing down, so he took a year, um, long story, I'm going to tell it, but all of a sudden we didn't have medical insurance. And we had three broken arms in one year. Thank God we went to a small town doctor. I'm sure he would have thought I was breaking my kids' arms. And, and then, without medical insurance, Kayla gets something called um, tracheal bronchitis and pneumonia all at once. Boom, she's like 14 months old. And I take her to the hospital in the small town of Patterson. There was a hospital there then. It's not there now. And they admit her, and she's there for like 10 days. We have no insurance. We have no insurance. And we had three broken arms. Then we had, all of a sudden, we had that debt-free world that we had lived in. We had all this medical debt. One of the arms had to have surgery. And then Kayla can't breathe. And I stayed with her the whole time. And Steve was taking care of the kids and doing all the things. And when we got home, it was like over $10,000 that her bill was at this small little hospital. And they had offered to move me to Modesto, but I was like, no, my kids live, my husband's right up there. It's like 45 minutes up that mountain. We have a church family. We had just started going to that church. You know that that tragedy knit my heart together with those people from church? I woke up and someone had put a toothbrush and mascara on the thing in front of me and said, here. And I'm like, dude, and back that, all I needed was mascara. Now I'm like, concealer, please. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody else brought me some lunch and all of a sudden my heart was leaving this church that I loved in San Jose and it was transferring a loyalty and a, and a knit my heart to them but we get home and it's like 10, 000, over $10,000 in bills so I'm like don't open them just don't open them and Steve wasn't working he had taken a year off because they had paid him to finish close down this company and he was trying to build our house and we had to live on a really tight budget because we were on you know he wasn't working and so finally you get the pink envelope. And you're like, okay, we have a pressure to open it because it's pink. <laughs> so open it, and it's like over $10,000. And I call him up on the phone, and I'm like, you know, here's the thing. We're not working. We can't pay this. And they said, okay, give me your information. I'll call you back. So I'm like, okay. And we, we pay $10 a month for the rest of our lives. And they called back, and they said, in California, there's a cigarette tax. And a certain amount of money goes to each hospital every year to cover the cigarette tax to go for children that are uninsured. And your daughter was the only child in this hospital all year. <laughs> and your dad has been paid in full. Right? Right? See, God's going to show us. He's right there. And then we had all this other debt from these broken arms, and then we had an opportunity to go to Texas, and we were like, yeah, let's do it, and God did some cool stuff there. And our oldest son, Tony, did not come to our family until he was 15 years old. And you can read in Mom's Raising Sons how he was in an abusive home, and he became our son. He's, he's the one that's the fighter pilot in the Air Force. He's a lieutenant colonel. Just brag a little bit. <laughs> Rival. Uh, <laughs> but, but you know what? This is a story, and I, I know I have to be done. This is a story that it, Howard Hendricks, you know Howard Hendricks, the... Um, Dallas Theological Seminary just recently passed away. Great book to read is Teaching to Change Lives. Short, easy read. And he tells a story of this, this small church, I think it was a church plant, and this one man in the church said, I want to start a sixth grade Sunday school class. And they were like, there are no sixth graders in the church, but go for it, a sixth grade boy Sunday class. So he said, okay. So this man started going out into the neighborhood of the church and played marbles with a group of little boys. And one of them was Howard Hendricks. And this man invited Howard Hendricks to come to church. And Howard Hendricks was not in a great home. And he came to Christ. And that man grew up. He's a professor. He has no telling how many pastors he has equipped for ministry. Because one man, who was not very well educated, played marbles with him in the street. Wow. Everybody say, God chose me to minister to the minister. God chose me to minister to the minister. We will be blessed if we are humble. 
One of the blessings is the ability to deal with anxiety. I wonder if I can finish this. I'm going to do it really fast. Peter's story. He was worried about drowning. He was worried about position and recognition. He was worried when the soldiers came in the garden. He was worried when Jesus was crucified that he didn't want to be, you know, all that. Worried about being identified. Worried that he would no longer be fit to minister after he denied Christ. Remember, he went back to his old career. He went back fishing. And when Jesus raised, he said, go tell the disciples. And Peter. Yeah. After God humbled Peter, there was no stopping him, and God blessed him with peace. The key to victory over anxiety is to never pridefully contest God's wisdom, but rather to humbly accept whatever God brings or allows into your life as coming from and through his loving hand. When David tried to bring, before he danced in the streets, they tried to bring the ark in, remember? And is it Uzzah? Is that his name, Uzzah? Uh, reached over because the ark started to stumble and, and, then it, and then he, God killed him. God got mad and killed him. This big parade, happy days. Why did God get angry? Because David tried to do God's work, moving the ark, man's way. And God became angry and he did not bless his attempt. Ladies, we have to be aware of this. We cannot do God's work man's way. You are not a marketing team. You are not a corporate office or a corporation. And your goal is not to build a mega church. And there's nothing wrong with mega churches. But let me tell you something. When Jesus fed the 5,000 plus, and then he started preaching covenant, eat of my flesh, drink of my blood, and they, he preached the hard stuff. And they walked away, Right? And then he turned to the disciples, and Peter finally didn't put his foot in his mouth, wherever you go, and he said, where will we go? You have the words of eternal life. And he had the 12. Pour into the 12. You may have a handful of women that want to do a Bible study with you. You pour into them. If you're a Sunday school teacher, I had a lady, old hippie lady, that wore Birkenstocks back in the 60s, and they're back now, so there you go. Um, gray, long gray hair, she drove a VW Bug. I mean, she was... I was born in 1961, so that was right around that era. And she drove and picked up kids in our neighborhood and took us to uh, Pioneer Girls. And it was Jet Cadets for Jesus. And I learned so much scripture because this one woman faithfully every Wednesday night would come and get us and take us. I don't know her name. I wish I did. I remember when I was at camp, I was in fifth grade, and I was at a youth camp, and I remember the, the children's pastor would, by the fire, tell the story of Esther, and it came to life for me. And at that camp, I went forward, and I'm like, I guess I'll be a missionary, because I thought that was all that you could do if you love Jesus, if you're a woman, because back then, everybody had a slideshow. Now it's, you know, Facebook, but back then, it was like, and these are the, they were really just trying to get you to give money. But I was scared to death. I'm like, I don't want to be, a, and I remember I went home, and my girlfriend's mom was there, and I told her, I said, yeah, I went forward to be a, new, a missionary. And she said, oh, honey, no. And I said, why? And she goes, you're too pretty. <laughs> You don't want to go there. Let God send someone else. Confusing. <laughs> go and preach the gospel and make disciples. Make disciples. Preach the gospel and make disciples. And God turned the world upside down through that handful of men. Don't worry about the numbers. You know, it's easy when those people are like, oh, this message would have been so great for them, their marriage is in trouble, and they're, they're not even here. <laughs> right? Instead, just say, oh, but they are here. Say, God chose me to minister to the minister. I'll tell one story, and then we're going to be done. Um, Oswald Chambers, my utmost for his highest. I love that story. Biddy Chambers, his wife. I, I love reading biographies of, because they're just normal people in their generation that God did amazing things. They didn't know it at the time what was happening. They just did what God called them to do. Well, when Biddy was in college, she had planned to be a stenographer, and her goal, her career goal, was to take notes for the prime minister. And she was good. And she fell in love with Oswald. She married him. And he's like, we're going to be missionaries. We're going to go share the gospel. And her dream of being a stenographer was put on hold. And she followed him wherever he went, and he was an evangelist. You guys should read his story. I mean, he just found places to share the gospel. And I think we're going to show a video tomorrow that I got to, I got to do the, the staff devotions for Dobson's staff when I was interviewed on his show, and I was like super intimidated, and I'm like, no, talk about sharing the gospel. That's my passion. Um, so you can watch that tomorrow if you want to. But... But here he is just making ways to 
find in Egypt and all over, and he is doing great, and the world knows about him back in, you know. And then he dies. She's got one girl, and he dies. I think it's appendicitis. He's like 40-something. She's like, dude, I'm going to a job. What am I going to do? In the height of his ministry. That doesn't make sense. And as the story goes, every message that Oswald Chamberlain had preached, she hand-wrote Every book you have ever read, including My Utmost for His Highest, by Oswald Chambers, was penned by his wife after he died. God chose her to minister to the minister. And then, look and see, I'm doing something in your day that you would not believe, even if I told you. So every time you see that Utmost for His Highest in the back of somebody's toilet, you think, Biddy. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to wrap it up, but what I want you to do is pull out that paper that I gave you. And it is Psalm 51. And I kind of think I want you to stand up. And we're going to read this out loud together. Because this is what I want us to do, ladies. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You know what your junk is. You know what your stuff is. You know where you're stuck. You know what you've excused. You know what you've ignored. There's not one of us in here that can say, oh, no, I'm good. <laughs> because we all know, I just had a situation. Oh, my goodness, I just had a situation. And I know God did it for you. Somebody that I was very close to in our church just pulled the rug out and sent me this text that just, I, I lost sleep over it. I just ached over it. I tried to fix it. I went to their house. And what can I do? Let me apologize. What can I do? And I couldn't get past it. And it hurt. And you have to really wrestle with not being stuck there. Or discarding them. Fine. Fine. And I know God did that, so I remember to tell you, I get it. It's hard. So whatever that sin is, I want you to take some time tonight. We're going to go over this, and then we're going to just spend a little bit of time just alone yourself with the Lord. You want to see God for who he really is? Ask him to create in you a clean heart. Ask him to show you the sin that has you stuck, that's stealing your joy, that's not allowing you to be all in. Let's read it together. Psalm 51, verse 1 through 4. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly in my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear the joy of gladness, and the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Open, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or I will give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. And then underneath there it says, it's time to let the Spirit search your hearts, ladies. Ask God to cause you to repent with a contrite heart so that we can sanctify the Lord in our hearts and be ready to give an answer for our hope with meekness and fear. So go ahead and sit down. And we're just going to take a few minutes. And, and I want you to really ask God to show you. 
And it doesn't mean you're all like, oh, you're all hiding stuff, I get it. But there might be a vent. What is that thing you wrestle with more often than not? What is that thing that you kind of go back to? And Jordan, will you play that song for me? We're going to play a song. And I just want you to close your eyes. It's an old song from a camp that Steve and I used to teach at years ago, but I just love this song. Um, and just listen to the words of it and just pray it to the Lord. Pray this. Just, just ask God, show me. Create me a clean heart. Show me. And then after we're done, Shelly, you can come up. Feel free to kneel if you want to.
Um, we just thank Rhonda for that time. If you guys want to stay in here and you've got, you want to pray, you want to visit, that's fine. Our whole schedule this weekend is made up for you guys to have your time. Do what you need to do. Um, it's made for you. You can attend things. You can not attend things. You're totally free to make your schedule. These are just options. Right now we do have a snack option. You can choose to go. You can choose not to go. Um, we're having ice cream down the dining hall. We do ask all the first timers if you guys would like to stay here for a little bit, meet some of our council. We'd like to get to know you, answer some questions. And if you're here for the first time, you can just meet us up here. And we'd love to uh, chat with you just for a minute. And then you can go have ice cream down there and socialize and there would be some games you can um, participate in. But if you need to stay up here and, and um, talk or deal with God, then you're more than welcome to do that. So we'll just see you tomorrow.